unexplored jungle, a young biologist, and the discovery that would spark the rest of his career. Welcome to Season 1, Episode 8 of Nonfiction Fridays, the series where I share unbelievable stories that really happened. In today's episode, we'll be talking about the early explorations of Donald Perry, set amidst the Costa Rican jungle, and in particular, one adventure that would lead to the start of many, many others. It's the mid-1970s, and Donald Perry is working as a cellular biologist and kind of discovering that lab life is not for him. In search of something more exciting, he decides to attend a lecture in the Life in Science building where a professor is talking about life in the tropics. Amidst this lecture, he mentions that little to nothing is known about the canopy environment, and hearing this sparks something within Perry, and he decides that this is what he wants to study for his master's degree. Even though there was no known way to access the canopy and it had never been done before, his advisor signed off on it and off to Costa Rica, Perry went. It would be quite a journey within itself to get to the area of forest where he wanted to study. He would have to take several planes, several cars, and a bus ride. He spent his first night in Costa Rica at a hotel that was not really a hotel at all. Its walls didn't meet the ceilings, there were bed bugs, a straw mattress, and he could hear everyone around him. One uncomfortable night there, later, a short flight and a jeep ride, he finally found himself in Rincon, where he would be able to hole up for a few days and really start his studies. Upon arrival, he met the director of the logging camp, who would be in charge of his safety during the length of his stay, and he was welcomed with terrifying tales of previous explorers and misadventures in the jungle from men who had dared to take it on. One of these stories included a biologist who was studying a species of pig in the area, and he had to be carried out, and his wounds, after being attacked by one of these animals, took over a hundred stitches to fix. Another of these stories involved a logging worker who was unfortunately bit by one of the region's most poisonous snakes, who then passed away on the boat ride to the closest town with blood coming out of his pores and his ears. These tales, of course, were intended to frighten Perry, and they did have their effect, especially later that night when he was in camp, in his little room, which you know, wasn't the best room. There was guano dripping from the ceiling and there was holes in the walls and, and things of that nature. So he's laying there thinking about all this man has said and kind of just feeling down on his luck and a little bit freaked out about the whole adventure as any adventurer does at some point when suddenly he hears a rustling in the corner. So he sits up, doesn't see anything, lays back down and then he hears it again and he sits up and all this fear was over a small animal that's quite common in the region. Its little head was peering out of one of the holes in the wall and it just stared at him watching his every move. He breathed a sigh of relief knowing that this was nothing to really worry about, kind of gathered his wits and went to bed to start the next day fresh. The next day, his hired guide arrived, and this was an older man who was a local, and he would be able to not only teach Perry about what to look out for in the jungle, but he would also be able to give him a little bit more information on which trees might be suitable for climbing and which trees might not be. Together, they set out, crossing a river, chopping down several yards of thick brush, until suddenly the brush was all gone and the forest opened up before them. Many people have compared these jungles to cathedrals, and Perry found the description very accurate. Jungles like this one are often inaccurately described as having tons of debris and growth on the grounds so that you can hardly get through it. But that's not really true in this area of the jungle because the canopy is so thick that very little light penetrates to the ground. So most of the time you're just able to walk and the trees kind of seem like columns in a cathedral and you feel that same sort of small insignificance that you are just one little speck in a much grander majesty. After walking for some time, they came across a tree whose trunk was 10 feet in diameter. It had vegetation all along its bark and Perry described it as looking as a Mayan ruin that had been slowly reclaimed by nature. The tree was an Anacardium excelsium, which is related to a cashew nut tree. It was 120 feet tall and you could not even see the highest limbs. This is the tree that Perry decided he wanted to climb or attempt to climb. The next step was of course figuring out how to get there because this had never been done before. Most trees in virgin jungles do not have lower branches and this tree was no exception. So climbing from limb to limb from bottom to top wasn't going to be an option. The lowest limb that looked able to carry any weight at all was about 60 feet high. Armed with a crossbow, some fishing line, and two 9mm ropes, 
Perry's idea was to tie fishing line to an arrow, shoot it up into the tree, and try to angle it just right so that it went over a strong, sturdy branch, would come back down to the other side, and then he could take the other end of the fishing line, tie that to the rope, and use the arrow that fell to the ground to pull the rope across the limb. He got really lucky, and he actually shot the second shot perfectly, but unfortunately the fishing line wasn't strong enough to pull the rope all that way up, so he had to do it again with a nylon cord instead. 30 minutes later, he had had a rope put across the branch that he had aimed for on this tree, and the next step was, of course, to start climbing. Of course, Perry anchored the rope, and then he put on a harness, and he had two ascenders. The first ascender would be attached to his chest harness, and the second ascender was strapped to two footholds. So essentially, he would be inchworming his way up this rope until he hit the canopy. So he slowly makes his way up the tree, and then he hits his first hurdle, which is a bunch of branches, lower branches in the way of him getting to the topmost branch where his rope is. So he has to sort of fight his way through those with the machete, which kind of freaks him out a little bit because obviously the only thing holding him up is one rope and a branch that he doesn't even know if it's trustworthy. Regardless, he makes his way through and as he does so, as he keeps going slowly upward, it's like he's entering another world entirely. The higher he gets, the more the branches below him start to obscure the view of the ground below. The air becomes lighter and less humid with this slight breeze coming in from the canopy. And all around him, all over this tree and all the branches are a myriad of other plants and lots of different species that are using this tree as an environment all its own. There's Monstera on one limb, Anthuriums on another, there's bromeliads too, they're like tiny bushes forging a life wherever they could find along this tree system. This entire first experience reminded Perry very much of the ocean, and it was a comparison he would make time and time again. When he was scuba diving, he got the sense that so much of ocean life takes place at the surface where the light touches, and the deeper you go, the stranger life gets, and the more seldom it gets. He felt the same way about the jungle, where the canopies were really where life was taking place, and it was a really hard place to access. When you're in the ocean, you can just grab a boat and some swimming gear, and then you're already in among it. But in the forest, he had to find a way to climb to be a part of that canopy. And he often wished that he could find the power of flight like a bird to be able to witness all the different communities that found a home there. On this one tree alone, over 100 feet in the air, snakes, insects, birds, primates, all made this one tree part of their extensive canopy home. On this first ascent, he was met with several of those, including a sweat bee, a scorpion, a delicate orchid, and also one unexpected discovery. Still attached to his rope, he was kicking from limb to limb to see what he could see within the confines of this rope that he had tied. At one point, his feet kicked against the main trunk of the tree, and it made a strange sound. So he kicked again, and the sound repeated. It was clear from this sound that the tree was hollow. Just a few moments later, he heard the buzz of a bee, and so he looked upwards, very curious about the pollination methods within the canopy itself, something that he really wanted to study. So he starts watching this bee very, very closely, and as it's going from flower to flower on this little plant up there, it's knocking a few petals around as it goes. One petal that the bee knocks loose sort of drifts slowly down and it catches Perry's eye, and he realizes that it's descending into the core of the tree itself. And he's a little confused by this, so he wants to investigate closer. He manages to climb up and support himself on some limbs, and he finds himself peering into a vast hole. The tree is hollow and he can see that there is an access point to get inside of it, and he knows that he is going to have to come back. It's just too irresistible not to explore it. The opening is about three feet wide, and he can see the ruffling of some sort of life inside, what he thinks is bats. And so knowing that it is man-sized, that he could fit in there, and that there is life inside, he makes plans to find a way to come back and go inside. The day comes, he makes it to the tree again with his guide, who he had not told that he was planning on climbing, let alone going inside of this tree. And his guide is visibly upset by this because he is responsible for Perry's safety, and if something goes wrong while Perry is inside this tree, they have no idea how he would even help him or how Perry could even help himself. They know that this is incredibly risky, but Perry feels this incredible pull that he just has to do it. He says to himself that any good biologist would not be able to resist it, but 
That doesn't mean that even though he really wanted to, he didn't have to give himself a few pep talks before he managed to scrounge up the courage to go inside. He climbs up the tree as before, finds the hollow, and then ties off an anchor point on one of the closest branches. And then he begins his descent. The first thing he notices as he slowly starts to rappel down is this incredibly powerful, extremely unpleasant smell. Luckily, your senses kind of get used to such things, and so after a few moments of Letting that be what it was, he continued his descent. Before he went down, he had absolutely covered himself in protective clothing and tons of netting to protect himself from whatever he might find inside. He stops near the opening and turns on his headlamp to see what he can see, but the light can't penetrate the darkness very far, so he takes a penny from one of his pockets and drops it, and it takes about two seconds for it to hit the floor. Imagine yourself for a minute suspended like this, in almost complete darkness, just the glow of your headlamp and a little bit of light coming in from the top of this hollow in a 120 foot tree, with the knowledge of the fact that if something goes wrong, you're on your own. You're surrounded in darkness. There's a strange sort of quiet. You can't help but feel a combination of fear and wonder. And it's exactly at a moment like this when suddenly a colony of bats decides they are so disturbed by Perry's presence that they almost kamikaze attack him just to be able to fly out of their exit hole at the top. So that sort of startles him, and that startles the gnats that feed on the bat's guano. He startles, the rope swings a bit, he's swatting flies away until suddenly it dies down again. And it's just him and the darkness with the headlamp and 100% humidity in 80 degree weather. He's starting to sweat so much that it's forming these little clouds of mist around him that's illuminated by his headlamp as he turns around, dangling from this rope. He feels in between worlds, and suddenly a sort of claustrophobia and a bit of panic swoops over him, and not knowing what else to do, he begins his descent once again. Pure white plate fungi coat the walls, and every plate seems to be home to a colony of leaf hoppers at various stages of their life cycle. From each of these plates hangs a type of fungi that Perry had never seen before. They hang down like small chandeliers. When Perry tried to take these back out of the cave, they quickly dissolved into liquid, so he was never able to photograph or record them. As he descended further, he saw termite colonies, wood-boring beetles, crickets, roaches, and even a scorpion. He stopped his descent at about three feet above the ground and just decided to turn off his headlamp just to see what it was like for the inhabitants of this hollow. The only strong light source is coming from above, and it looks like the moon on a black, cloudless night. He soaks this in for a moment, and then decides to turn his headlamp back on. Right as he turns it on, the light beam goes straight to a very small, strange creature that takes him by surprise. It's a small, blonde, rat-like animal that freezes as soon as the light beam hits it. It was actually a rat possum, so frozen by being seen in such an inconceivable place that even when Perry reaches out his finger to nudge it in the ribcage, it doesn't move. Then, out of the corner of his eye, he notices some movement in the dirt beneath him. His headlamp catches the eye shine of a good-sized animal, and it turns out it's actually one of the biggest frogs within Costa Rica, known for their aggression and for eating snakes up to half a yard long. Startled by Perry, it disappeared seemingly into nowhere, and as Perry descended a little bit further and peered around the edges of the floor, he realized that some of the roots of this tree are also hollow, and on closer inspection, he can see the tracks of many different animals that must use this little system as a bit of a subterranean highway, and possibly use the tree itself as a feeding ground for all of the insects that are found within it. He turned off his headlamp again, just to see what other creatures might arrive. After a few minutes go by, he notices some things seem to appear along the wall, and he thinks at first that it's just his eyes are adjusting to the light, but upon closer inspection, he realizes that there is actually a small cone on the opposite wall, a small hole shaped like a cone that is projecting a certain amount of light through to the opposite wall. Within itself, this created a sort of crude optical device, a camera obscura, and it was projecting the outside world onto the inside wall. And he could actually see his guide pacing, a blurry image of his guide pacing back and forth, who must have been worried about him, wondering what's going on, because they have no way of communicating. Perry gets a little excited that he's able to see him, and they are pretty much on the same level now, so Perry starts shouting towards the hole as loud as he can, but he can't get this guy's attention. His voice is so muffled by the confines of this 
tree cavern. In this moment, he realizes how isolated he really is from the rest of civilization. He checks his watch, and five hours have gone by, much longer than it felt. He made his way back up the hollow, feeling very much like Alice in Wonderland. This particular adventure happened in 1974, but over the years, Perry would continue going back to Costa Rica and would actually devise a first system of its kind that allowed him to move between taller trees using ropes alone, which he would then lower down onto the canopy. He built some tree platforms, a tree hammock, so that he could observe with as minimal intrusion as possible the canopy communities and the environment that these trees create within themselves. The hollow tree was one of the first adventures in this tree climb career of his, and he would use all the information gathered to add to the important work, the important data collection of what goes on in these trees and how they impact the world at large. If you'd like to know more about this story, be sure to check out Donald Perry's book, Life Above the Jungle Floor, his biologist's account of the enchanting world he found along the jungle's treetops. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out all eight episodes of Nonfiction Friday Season 1. This is the last episode of Season 1, and if you do want there to be a Season 2, make sure you leave me a comment below so that I can decide if I want to start planning. If you're new here and you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead, press that subscribe button, and I will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching. Bye, guys.